Hello, and welcome to School Day at NTTBF, hosted by the Library Science Program at um, Sam Houston State University's College of Education. I'm Jill Bellamy. I'm the librarian at McCullough Intermediate and Highland Park Middle School in Dallas, and a member of the NTTBF Steering Committee. Today, I am honored to moderate the 100 Years of the Newberry Award panel. Now, let's welcome our esteemed panel. Tay Keller. Welcome, Tay. Tay is the author of The Science of Breakable Things and the New York Times bestselling When You Trap a Tiger, the winner of the 2021 Newberry Medal and the Asian Pacific Award. She grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii, where she started writing as soon as she could hold a pencil. Now she lives in Seattle, where she writes about biracial girls trying to find their voices. Welcome, Tay Keller. Next, let's welcome Erin Entrada Kelly. Erin began her career as an award-winning journalist and magazine editor. She is now the New York Times bestselling author of multiple children's books, including Hello Universe, which won the 2018 Newbery Medal Award, and We Dream of Space, a 2021 Newbery Honor. She lives in Delaware, where she teaches in the MFA programs at Hamline University and Rosemont College. Welcome, Erin and Trotta Kelly. Hey. And finally, we round out this all-star panel with Christina soon Tornbot. Christina is the author of over a dozen books of children for all ages. In 2021, she was awarded a Newbery Honor for her novel, A Wish in the Dark, and another honor for her nonfiction book, All 13, The Incredible Cave Rescue of the Thai Boys Soccer Team. She is passionate about STEM, and she spent many years working in the science museum field, designing programs and exhibits for kids. Welcome, Christina Sintornvat. Yay. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. It is such a delight to be with you today. Um, now let's get started with a few questions. So obviously on this panel, we are joining in the celebration of the Newberry's 100 year anniversary. And as most know, the Newberry Award winners all receive an early morning phone call from the committee on the day of the award announcements. Can you tell us a little bit about getting that call or calls for some of you? Tay, how about we start with you? Um, sure. So I had heard the lore about the Newberry and about that early morning phone call. Um, but because I got the award this year, uh, everything was on Zoom. Um, so instead of that early morning phone call, they scheduled a Zoom for the day before. Um, and it was kind of this ruse that my publisher set up. So I had heard that I had just won the Asian Pacific Award, which was so exciting and so meaningful for me. And my publisher said, okay, we're gonna set up a call with the Asian Pacific Committee and they're just gonna congratulate you. And so that's what I was expecting on this Zoom call on Sunday. Um, and so I logged in and it was, first of all, it was, it was a Zoom room full of um, not just Asian people. So I was like, okay, something's going on. <laughs> um, and then um, the Newberry chair started saying, you know, introducing herself as the Newberry chair. And I, my first reaction was that someone had sent me the wrong Zoom link and I was just kind of frozen, like, ah, <laughs> um, like someone's going to figure it out like really quickly. And then it's going to be so horrifying and embarrassing for everybody. Um, but then they all held up my book with the sticker on it. And I realized that it was actually happening <laughs> um, and it was still so hard to process. And I asked them to repeat it <laughs> since I had kind of like blacked out in panic as they were speaking. Um, and then immediately after they hung up, hung up on the call, I just burst into tears. And my husband was watching from the other room and he ran over and he was like, did that just happen? And I like, couldn't even respond because I was crying so much, uh, but it was totally surreal and amazing. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Christina, how about you? Two honors in one year. Tell us about that. Did you have two uh, calls? Yes, I got two calls. Um, I love hearing that. I've never heard that story, that full story of Taze before. So that is so, I love that they tricked you. They just lied to you. That's so <laughs> mean. <laughs> um, yeah, I also had heard all these stories about you get a call the morning of, and I just, I wasn't, that was just like not on my radar at all. Um, 
And but yeah, the the call came the night before, the evening before, and my husband and I were making dinner, and my kids were FaceTiming with their grandparents in the other room, and like so, they my daughter comes in, she's like, "Mom, you you keep getting a call from like a library something in Chicago," and I don't know what I, I, what I was thinking, but I just something told me like this is important, and I just hung up on their grandparents. I did not say a word to them. I didn't say like, oh, let us call you back. I just hung up on them <laughs> and took the call. And it was, um, and it was, you know, they patched me through and they said the whole thing like, this is the Newberry committee. We're calling to tell you about, they told me all 13. I feel like maybe they were going in alphabetical order or something. Um, but so they, they called about all 13 and I, I burst into tears. My husband was there and he also burst into tears. And then because my kids had been FaceTiming, my phone died and the battery, I ran out, my battery ran out. And I was just like so mortified. I think I was just like talking on and on while and my battery was dead for like several minutes. So then later I got a call back later and I thought, you know, like this is them just calling to finish the phone call. So I was like apologizing profusely. My phone died, da, da, da. And they were like, no, 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 we're calling because a wish in the dark. And, and they told me about a wish in the dark. And I also was like, this isn't real. Like, I think this is a mistake. Like, but you can't take it back now. So <laughs> yeah, it was just, I mean, you know, just crazy. I can't believe it. Still can't believe it. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. I love that you got two calls and a chance to apologize for the first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Erin, how about you? You've received two calls. Can you tell us about your experiences? Sure. So for the first one for Hello Universe, I too knew about the early morning phone call, but of course it wasn't on my radar because I don't think anyone is sitting there like, well, obviously they're going to call me, right? So I didn't expect to get a call. But I, I knew I did know it happened early in the morning. So when I didn't get a call early in the morning, I was just like, okay, you know, it's another, it's another, I guess, Monday morning to go to work. So I get in my car, I'm on my way to work. And I worked in Philly at the time. And I was just in traffic, like morning rush hour traffic. And it's like 830. And I'm sitting there wondering, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to find out who won the, the Newberry medal this year. That's gonna be so exciting. And then I got all these like, texts from my editor saying, where are you? What are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm driving, I'm going to work. What am I supposed to be doing? And she said, well, someone's going to call you, just make sure you pick up. And my heart's like beating and I'm like, what is going on? And so the call came through and I picked it up and I'm like on Bluetooth in traffic and it was the Newberry committee. And as it turns out, they had had my old phone number. Um, from my Louisiana number, but I had since left Louisiana, of course. So I always joke that someone in Louisiana probably thinks they won the Newberry Medal now because they probably left them a message or something. Um, so the call came through and they're like, we've been trying to get in touch with you. And then they told me, and of course I was in shock, you know? And so there was like a big long pause and I actually have the call on YouTube, which I've watched a million times, right? To relive the moment. So there's like this big long pause after they're done talking and then they all cheer, the whole committee cheered. And then there's like silence and you can just see them all looking at the phone, like waiting for me to say something. And I just say, wait, what happened? Uh, and then they had to repeat the whole thing over again. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, I'm in traffic. I have to go home. Like, I, you know, I start rambling about nothing about how I'm good in traffic and I need to get off 95 and you know what I mean? So I did. I called out from work. I hung up and I called. So I'm like, I'm not coming in today. Something happened, uh, you know. And then I just like got out of traffic and went right back home. Um, so that was the first call. And then for the Newberry Honor for We Dream of Space, I was out walking my dog, you know, living my life. And I come back in, and on my phone, there's all these, like, there's like all these texts and missed calls and stuff. And I have a spam blocker on my phone because, you know, spam. So my phone will not accept unfamiliar numbers, especially from out of state. So I'm looking through, I'm looking at these numbers and it's like Chicago, ALA. I'm like, what? No, because number one, it was the night before. So I was like, well, this can't be anything. And I was like, but why would they be calling me anyway? And then I see all these texts and it says, Aaron, this is not spam. 
please pick up the phone. Um, and then I'm like, okay, I'm here. Call me right back. So they call back and my phone declines it like three times in a row. Anyway, I finally, I don't know how I'm just like pushing buttons. Like I'm just like a maniac. Like I don't know how to get rid of the spam blocker because it was very diligently doing its job. But finally it came through and they told me I was in total shock. Of course, I'm like screaming and all this other kind of stuff. And then my partner, Dan comes in, he had left to get takeout. So he comes in with these big bags of takeout and I'm like, ah! I'm like off the phone, but crying and screaming. And he's like, what happened? He doesn't know if it's good or bad. Cause I'm just, you know, just like, ah! he's like, what happened? And I'm like, something happened. I couldn't, I couldn't speak. And he's just standing there with all this like Chinese food, like, um, what's going on? Um, but finally I was able to explain. So those were my two experiences. <laughs> those are great. Thank you so much, all of you for sharing and congratulations. All are so well-deserved. Um, and thank you for sharing those experiences. All right. So that was the moment you found out. Then how did your life change after winning these awards? Let's start. How about with Christina this time? Um, oh my gosh. I mean, a lot of, a lot of things changed. Like I, I got asked to, you know, do a lot more public speaking, which it's really funny that, um, people assume that because you can write words, you should be able to speak words. <laughs> that's not, doesn't necessarily come easy, more easily, but no, that's been great because I've, I, you know, I got to do a lot of, lot more school visits. Um, of course, since, you know, the past couple years have been so weird, everything's been on Zoom. So I think in a way, like, a, not a lot changed, you know? Did, did y'all feel the same that like, it kind of felt like, did it really happen? Like you, cause you're still kind of in your house. Like you don't go in person and like people aren't like, you know, shaking you and being like, ah! So, um, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, like the next day I just still did my laundry and had to work on my book that was due. And <laughs> so it, it's been different and not different. What, what about you? Do you feel the same? Yeah. I feel like it's been, think, yeah, yeah it, it's been similar. Like, you know, with, um, with Hello Universe, uh, things changed very like dramatically in a very like tangible way, you know, like I'm invited to speak at all these things. All of a sudden I'm really popular <laughs> and like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to this, I'm going to that, I'm speaking to, you know, so that changed a lot. And all of a sudden, like I earn out my advance and now it's like foreign, foreign rights and all this stuff. Like, things that may probably would not have happened before. And then the New York Times list, you know, like all this craziness started happening. Um, but for but for We Dream of Space, it was it was much less because, like you said, there wasn't as much interaction. I mean, there was still like a lot of excitement, but you don't get like the people hugging you and shaking you and like screaming and jumping up and down. What about you, Tay? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, I, the public speaking thing, uh, that has been a big change doing a lot of Zoom visits with schools, which has been really cool. Um, but it also kind of feels a little bit like the Newbery for me just exists like on my computer screen. <laughs> like I don't really know people or interact with people outside that know what that is, except for some of my friends who are like, oh, I read The Giver. That's so cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's this, this weird thing where a lot has changed, but also in my daily life, everything kind of feels the same. Um, but I do feel like um, kind of how I've been thinking about it is that the, the award has given such security in this career where there's so little security mm -hmm. in writing books. And my thinking about my future of writing has really changed from being more about how long can I do this for? How, what's my next book? When can I sell my next book? How long can I be a writer? Or I'm writing for now and we'll see how long that lasts. It's kind of just, I am a writer and I don't have to qualify it and I don't have to think of it as something so temporary. Um, and that has just been the biggest gift of the new very Yeah. I love that. And that's, that's so true. And, and I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming both of you will agree with this, like it, it gives you that sense of security, but it still doesn't like quash the 
you know, the imposter syndrome that lives inside. All. Like a lot of people ask me, are you like, oh, I won the Newberry. Wow. I'm like really talented. <laughs> I'm like, no. No. Yeah. I still have yeah. just as much self-doubt as, as I ever did. Like that doesn't change. Yes. Yeah. I think it's been a, a good experience for me because like, I'm sure I'm like everybody where you see people who like win an Oscar or like you see the people on like magazines and you're like, oh, like their life must be perfect or they just did this. They must be like so happy and so confident. But now that I right have the same experience, Aaron, of like, yeah, it's I'm the same. I feel the same, you know. I think outwardly it seems like, oh, you've got everything together, but you know, your, your book is the same. You're the same. <laughs> it's like you think, okay, I know how to write a book now, surely. And then you try to write your next book and yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's almost worse. Like, shouldn't, shouldn't I know how to do this? <laughs> shouldn't it be easier? <laughs> That's great. Thank you all so much. I loved hearing about that. And y'all are all amazing and you are rock stars to us. So <laughs> you definitely seem like those perfect people. All right. So let's switch gears just a touch um, and talk about you as youngsters. Were you readers when you were young? And was there one book that made you into a reader or maybe into a writer? And how about we'll start with Aaron this time? I was definitely a, a very avid reader. I always have been. And um, I would say, you know, when I was a kid, I really loved Sweet Pickles. I can't think of one book that like made me a reader, but S Sweet Pickles was like this monthly subscription service, right? For those of you who don't know, um, in the 80s, it was very popular. And I loved those books a lot. And I, th I think, though, that the books that made me want to be a writer were Judy Boyne's books, because it was when I started reading her, like in third or fourth grade is when I started writing my own stories that were kind of like Judy Bloom. And I wrote a lot of like Sweet Valley High knockoffs, you know, when, when, when you're starting out, of course, you write the books, you kind of mimic the books that you're reading. So, but I've been a, a lifelong reader. I know that's not true of all writers, but it's definitely true of me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about Tay, can you tell us about your reading and writing journey? Yeah, um, so I also always loved reading. Um, and I think the first books that I really remember when I thought of myself as a reader were the Magic Treehouse books, uh, because those were the first books that I read to myself. And I could go and check them out from the library and then, and then read them. And it was so exciting, this feeling of these are my books. And I loved my mom reading to me, but it was this whole new experience to get to read it for myself. Um, so that was really exciting. And then the book that I always think about when I think about my middle school self is Millicent Men Girl Genius. And that was one of my favorite books ever. I read it so many times and I had on my bookshelf, you know, in bookstores, how some of the books are facing out. I made a little display in my own bookshelf for Millicent Men. Um, and I just, it was my favorite book. And at my first ever author event, um, my first book was coming out and I went to NCTE um, and I was at a dinner with authors and Lisa Yee was sitting at the table with me and she's sitting on the other end of the table and I just kept, I was turning to the person next to me and I was like, Lisa Yee is sitting there. <laughs> she wrote Bells and Men and he was like, you should go talk to her. But I was so nervous because <laughs> it was my first book event and I, I still didn't feel like an author and this was my favorite author. So how could I possibly go talk to her? Um, so the whole dinner, I was kind of like typing myself, I'm like, hey, I can do this. And then afterwards, I was thinking, hey, I'm going to go up and I'm going to talk to her and I'm going to introduce myself and say, I'm an author too now. Your books inspired me so much, you know, like very calm and professional. And then I just, I walked up to her and I just ended up saying, oh, you're Lisa Yee. I love you. Um, so it was not my coolest moment, um, but it, it was amazing to Oh my gosh. Hey, I have, I have like the exact same Lisa Yee story um, at NCTE going to a dinner with Lisa Yee. It was not the same because you weren't there. And like, there were all these other author friends there and I saw her and I was like, Lisa Yee. And I like made her stand up and take a picture with me. 
And it was so awkward. Like I had no, it, I was not cool at all. And then afterwards we sat down and like, it was impossible to go on as a normal human and have dinner after I had had that reaction. It was very embarrassing, <laughs> but, and she's so sweet and nice, but yeah, I had the exact same reaction. I love that. <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, Christina, how about you? Were you a reader as a kid? And what, are there some books that inspired you specifically? Yeah, I, I was a big reader. I loved um, books. I just read everything. Probably fantasy. Fantasy books were my favorite, like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that whole series I read. And, um, you know, like The Hobbit and lots of Roald Dahl books. But I, so I, I mean, I feel like I was a reader from early on. And, but I do remember there was one book, it was in fourth grade. I was reading a book called A Dog Called Kitty. And um, do you know <laughs> the novel? I can't remember who the author is now, but it has the sweetest dog on the front. If you have ever read it, you know it is one of those sad dog books. And I remember it was like independent reading time. And I, I can remember so vividly looking up from my book and everyone in the class is staring at me because I had been crying, like weeping. And I didn't even know, I had no concept that, that people were looking at me. I was just so lost in this book of like what was happening to this dog. And like, I remember this girl named Katrina looking at me and saying, are you crying? And I was like, yes, yes I am. And like the whole class, like it was just like a moment of like, this is what books do to you, okay? You get invested, like it was very powerful. And I've cried in many books since then. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, so you all have new books that are coming out soon this spring. So would you like to tell us about those, what we have to look forward to? So exciting. How about Tay, we'll start with you first. Sure. Um, I have it right next to me. Uh, it's called Jennifer Chan is not alone. Um, I haven't really even talked about it yet on these things, um, but it is about a girl who is being bullied and ends up running away and the girls who bully her try to go find her. And it is also a book about searching for aliens. Um, so my editor likes to say that it is a book about feeling alienated while searching for aliens. Uh, which is a great line that she came up with. I, I never even thought about that. Uh, brilliant. Um, but yeah, so this was kind of a book that I drew a lot from my own experience in middle school. I was bullied, and so I was, I was bringing a lot of that into the book. Um, and then also kind of to balance it out was this alien element and thinking about if we're alone in the universe and, and what else is out there and all of these big questions about who we are in the world and the universe. Um, and so that was really fun to be able to do that research and kind of bring it into the story. That sounds great. I can't wait. I think it comes out April 12th, maybe? Uh, April yes. 6th. Oh, even better. Okay, Christina, how about you? What's next for you? Uh, my next book is also coming in April. It's called The Last Map Maker, and this is a fantasy adventure set on the high seas. So it's about a girl who is apprenticed to the most famous map maker in the kingdom. And he gets asked to go on this expedition to make a map of this unknown continent that the the kingdom is trying to discover and lay claim to and so her she's kind of trying to like run away also tay uh from her past and so she jumps at the chance to get on this expedition but there are secrets on board there are mutinies being planned there is a dragon that is kind of chasing them. They don't know if it's real or not real. So there's lots of danger for her to confront. And um, it's one of those books where it's like, you you go all the way around the world trying to get away from home, but you, you end up having to face like what you were running away from in the end. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> That sounds great, too. So another one to look forward to in April. And then Erin, I think you're just coming out in just another week or so, right? Yes, March 8th. So it's Ooh. those kids from Fawn Creek 
and it's about a very, very small town, Bond Creek, um, Louisiana. And the town is so small that their their uh, seventh grade is only twelve students. So they've gone to school with each other for, you know, since the dawn of man, as one of the narrators says. Um, so one day they get a new student. They've never had a new student before. So it's one of those stories, a new student comes to town and everything changes. So in the on the back it says, every day in Fawn Creek, Louisiana is exactly the same until Orchid Mason arrives. And that's Orchid. And um, it's dedicated to anyone with dreams bigger than their hometowns. Because when I was growing up, I was desperate. I daydreamed all the time about leaving my hometown. And I felt like I didn't belong there. You know, I felt like kind of like I was trapped there. And that was really a big inspiration for um, those kids from Fawn Creek. So that's March 8th. Yay, thank you. All those to look forward to. Great news stories for our middle grade readers and beyond. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, so let's switch to some audience questions now. We've got a few to wrap up with. Um, our first is from Christine, and she would like to know how long it takes you to write award-winning books. <laughs> that was a great question. <laughs> All right, so who would like to go first? Christine, would you like to start on this one? Sure. Um, gosh, I, I mean, I feel like every book is so different. Like. The last map maker, this book, I started, this was, in my mind, was going to be my second book. So I started writing this in 2015. Um, and oh, so how long is that? Seven years. That was seven years ago. <laughs> and, I, you know, it's been rewritten so many times. I, I had to, it went from third person to first person. The the protagonist has been a girl, a boy, a girl. It's got, like, I've just done so much with this till I figured it out. So, you know, A Wish in the Dark, I think took me a year to write and rewrite many times. Um, some, But sometimes like a picture book, I'll write that in a day, but then it'll take like months to fix it and make it perfect. So, or, you know, not perfect, but better. So yeah, it really depends for me. Erin, how about you? How long does it take you? Is it the same where it differs or do you have kind of a typical process? It kind of, a little bit of both. I think each book is different, like Christina said. It takes me about a year, um, but it's also hard to gauge because, you know, sometimes you start working on something and then you stop and then you pick it up again. And so it's hard to like put it in a timeline. But I would say it takes about a year, um, give or take, to write. And then as Christina said, rewrite and revise and all that stuff. And then it takes about another year to go through the whole editorial process and the jacket and the design and all that. So, you know, I usually answer about two years from when I start writing until the book is in my hands is, is usually like the process. But it all depends, too, because each book is different. But I'd say about a year. And Tay, how about you? Thank um, you, Erin. Yeah, so I think that figuring out the idea uh, takes maybe six months to five years. <laughs> um, I think that's not sitting down and working every day. It's more like when I am in between projects or just kind of daydreaming about things, shifting ideas, maybe writing in a notebook. Before I start writing, I have notebooks full of different notes about different possible characters, different things that maybe they say or their family lives. Um, so it's kind of the brainstorming stage happens in the background of other things uh, for a nebulous amount of time. Um, but then once I start, once I commit to a project and start working yeah. on it, that usually takes about two years, similar to what Erin was saying of, you know, it's, it's from when I'm starting to write to book in hand is about two years. And that process is for all three of my books have, has been about 20 different revisions. So rewriting it many, many times. <laughs> That's awesome. It must feel so great when you feel the book in your hand after all of that, all that time put in and then uh, so satisfying. All right, the next one, uh, many of our students are interested to know where you find your inspiration. You probably hear this question a lot. Um, does it come from personal experience or how do you find inspiration for your books? And how about we'll start with Aaron on this one. So just about all of my books start with a character. I'm very character 
driven as an author and as a reader. So usually my inspiration comes with, I, I think of a character, I kind of like organically a character arrives in my imagination for lack of a better word. And then I kind of start, like Tay was saying, that nebulous brainstorming session, which for me all comes out of the character. So with Hello Universe, for example, I had Virgil and I just was kind of like asking him questions in my imagination, you know, like, what's your life like? What's it like to walk around as you? What, what's your story? And then from that, I kind of think of the characters like the seed get, that gets planted in the soil and then the story grows like a tree and then it just becomes a story. So that's kind of how, and then I use when, I, when I'm building out the story and asking questions and figuring it out, of course, my personal experience, how, how could it not informs like a lot of those conversations I have with, with my characters, but that's how everything kind of begins. It's all inspired by a character. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Christina, how about you? Yeah. Um, yes, definitely character. I think I also, I think... <sighs> It's turned out that the books I'm I'm working on, the ideas that get into the books, they seem to be ideas I'm like wrestling with and like thinking about a lot. So like A Wish in the Dark, you know, the themes there were about the difference between what's the law and what's right. And, you know, are those two things the same or not? And um, And I think at that time, that was something that I was thinking about a lot. And the last map maker, it's about mistakes, making mistakes and how you make them right. Or, you know, you, you can never go back. You can never go back and change the past. So how do you keep going even when you've made a really big mistake? And I think I was just thinking about that a lot at the time. Like, um, so it's it seems like my my um, I don't know, my own wrestlings, my own thinkings get weave themselves into the book a lot. How about you, Tay? Yeah, uh, I feel similarly that kind of starting with a question that I don't know the answer to. So with the science of breakable things, it was, what do you do when someone that you love is sick? And then with when you trap a tiger, it was, what does a family story mean? And then with Jennifer Chan, it's how do you be a good person in a world that feels so big and uncertain? And these are these questions that don't really have answers. And so it kind of takes me a full book just to wrestle with these questions, like you're saying. Um, and I think the reason that the brainstorming stage is so nebulous and, and can take so long is that I'm starting with this question and I'm, I'm really drawn back to these themes and ideas and things that I'm trying to figure out. And I'm kind of experimenting and and different characters will will come into my imagination and i'm kind of you know seeing do they fit in this story and i have to explore that and, and see if the characters match or i'll be going about my day and then i'll i'll hear someone say something and i'll think oh that's that's a really interesting idea to put into the book and so it's kind of just having this question and then the things that I imagine or the things I see in my world as I go about my life kind of come in and all kind of become, it's like this, like a bird building a nest, like bringing in all of these random things and eventually making a story. Thank you for sharing. Thank you all for sharing your process. It's always so interesting for, um, for the rest of us to hear. And uh, one other question that is a super popular question, which again, I'm sure you hear a lot, but it's one that's always super important to our teens is what advice do you have for young aspiring writers? And Tay, how about you? Can you start for us this time? Sure. Um, I always think that my best advice is to have fun with writing uh, because there's so much advice out there, especially now when teens have access to the internet. Um, I know like even now as an adult, like I'll Google, like, how do you write? <laughs> and then I'll just spend like all day on the internet being like, ah, I'm not writing correctly. Um, so I think that you can really get in your head about that. And especially when you're young, I think that this is the best time to really enjoy it and, and think about why do you want to write? And whether it's, you know, you're really drawn to the idea of building big worlds or, you have these characters that you want to uh, get to know, or you have this experience that you want to tell, you have a story that you want to tell, just really thinking about 
why you want to write and then leaning into that and leaning into the joy and the fun of writing. That's great advice. Thank you. Erin, how about you? I love that. I love that, that idea of having fun because I think that one thing that stops people is this idea of like grammatical, like everything has to be grammatically perfect or a paragraph has to be so many sentences or you know, everything has to be spelled correctly. And I think that stops people a lot from exploring creatively. So I would say, like Tay said, have fun. Forget about all those rules because you're, you're writing creatively for you. So you get to make your own rules, which is really cool. And I also say, I have a lot of young writers who tell me, well, I start one story and I can't finish it because then I get excited about this other story. So what do I do? And I always tell them to follow their muse. So if you don't finish that story and you start another story, okay. You know, so what if you don't finish story number one, because eventually you'll find your way to a story that's going to hook you and you'll finish it. I mean, I have so many started and abandoned stories and manuscripts. So but I feel like if you start getting really prescriptive with yourself and saying, well, I, I have to finish this project before I can start this project, that's kind of hampering the fun part of it. So that's what I always say is like you kind of forget those those like rules and just have fun and follow your muse wherever it takes you. More great advice. Thank you. And Christina, how about you? Yeah, I, um, so I did not know that I was going to be an author as a kid. Like I never would have dreamed about that. I wasn't a, a, a like a kid who did a lot of writing or, you know, wanted to become an author when I grew up. Um, but I feel like looking back, I feel like I did so much work to become an author when I was younger. Um, like so much of what I write now, I'm drawing on things that I did, people I knew, stories I, I listened to, um, just like feelings I had and moments that I remember from being young, from being a kid. And I, when I listen to other authors talk, I feel like that's really similar. Like a lot of us, there's something about your childhood and your teenage years that it's just such a experience rich time that we all, we often dip back into those years to write about. So I feel like part of your your job, if you want to be a writer as a young person, is to just like really live, <laughs> really live like a lot and just like pay attention right now. So you don't really, you know, I don't think you have to be writing every day, um, but maybe you can like listen to stories that your grandparents tell or ask your parents about their childhood or, you know, when it's raining, go outside and listen to what that sounds like. Like you're going to soak it all up and it's going to come back out later. Um, so I think, yeah, it's like Tay said, have fun, not just with writing, but like with everything. <laughs> I love that. Thank you all so much. The teens are going to love that advice um, and from such award winning authors. They're all so, going to like walk out of their classrooms and be like, no, she said we have to go outside and live. <laughs> I'm and sorry. Not follow, yes, and not follow the rules. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, sadly, our time is up for today. And it has just been such an honor to be with you, beautiful ladies, accomplished ladies, um, award winning ladies. And just thank you so much for the books that you write for us, for our students. Um, you're just, you're doing amazing work and I so appreciate it. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank All you. right. Are we ready to say goodbye? Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.